Hey guys, Lou with LG Speed and Custom here. In this video, we're installing a Fat Man Fabrications IFS front end in John's 1950 Fargo. So this is John's 1950 Fargo. This is video two on the Fargo series. In video one, we backed this truck into the shop. It was a completely stock, unrestored, all original truck. We blew it apart, pulled the flat six out, pulled the original front suspension out, and now we're gonna fit this front end. This is a Fat Man Fabrications IFS front end. Full disclosure, I've never done a Fat Man front end before, but I've done Heist front ends, I've done TCI front ends, and the IFS front ends, they're all pretty similar. Crown Vic, Jim and I did a Crown Vic front end a while ago. They're really simple. A little bit too wide, in my opinion, for a lot of, especially stuff this old, but we did that one in a 1980 Ford pickup and it worked pretty good in there. So what's the advantage of an IFS front end? Well, IFS, for starters, IFS stands for independent front suspension, which means each wheel moves independent from the other. The original suspension in here was a straight axle front end, meaning one axle that both wheels are attached to, similar to how the rear axle is mounted in most vehicles. So by going to uh, independent front suspension, it improves the ride quality quite a bit. Uh, while we're doing that, it also upgrades the front end to a rack and pinion steering, which is a little bit more like a modern car, how a modern car drives. Uh, we're putting a power rack in this, so it's going to have power steering now, as well as disc brakes. We're putting disc brakes on the front end, too. Most of this, most of these are based off of like the 73 to 78 Mustang and Pinto front ends. However, they've evolved so much now, there's actually not any part at all that's in common with a, with a Mustang 2 front end. If you buy an original Mustang 2 front end and then buy one of these front ends, nothing is interchanges with them. They're just based off of that design. So anyways, we're going to mock this guy up. If you'll remember in the first video, for those that watched, we marked where our axle center line was before we took the front end out. So we'll center this guy up in there. I thought I was gonna have to build some boxing plates for this, because usually these cross members fit right up inside the frame rail here. But this Fat Man one, it appears to mount underneath. So. We kind of, we don't really need boxing plates, I guess. I'm not worried about the strength of this frame. This is a big old heavy duty farm truck. These frames are super tough as it is, so probably don't need to box it. I mean, we could always put a little box in where the suspension actually mounts. Wouldn't hurt anything. We can build motor mounts off that, but I don't know. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, let's get it mocked up in there. Gonna take some wax and grease remover here and just wipe this area down before I start sanding it. This is the side the steering box was on, so it's, it's a little greasy in here. Do that on both sides. down with some 80 grit. I don't know what kind of paint is on here, but it is tough stuff. I tried hitting it with the DA sander originally and it wasn't touching it. So I just used the big stripper wheel. I've drawn our axle center line back on here. Done the same on the other side. So if you'll remember from video one, we found this axle center line by hanging, we got the frame level and then we hung a plumb bob down until it centered on the axle and took a little center punch and punched our axle center line. So if I measure this line to like this hole and then go on that side and measure, it's like an inch difference. And if I measure from here to here, it's like an inch difference on each side. 
So this is not uncommon on vehicles that were built. You know, this is built in 1950. That's pretty common on stuff like that. So what we're gonna do is center the cross member up in there. I've marked on the cross member, we've got our center line as well. So we'll get it sitting up in there, put it on our marks, and then from there, we will kind of split the difference, I guess. And just as long as our cross member is square in there, and you know, maybe if we go a half inch further forward on one side and a half inch further back on the other side to split the difference of that axle center line, it should be okay. I think it'll be fine. So that's our next step. We'll mock it up in there. Yeah, I'm right on the center line on this side. All right, so I've put a couple little center marks on our cross member here that's centered between here and here and then I measured from this edge to there and this edge to there so I had a reference point on both sides. If we go back to our transmission cross member to our point we got 41 inches bang on on both sides. If we measure from this cross member back We've got 12 and three quarters and 12 and three quarters. Then if we cross measure, we've got these two little rivets right here. We cross measure to there. If I can get this to click in there. We've got 30 and three sixteenths. No, 30 and a quarter. If we go to this side, Thirty and five sixteenths. Well, it's in between five sixteenths and a quarter. That's close enough. We're welding it in there. Let's drag the welder over the TIG and we'll tack that up. So our center line on this side is still lined up with what we drew based off the front axle. But on this side, we're, we used to be there and now we're over here. So we came ahead like what, three eighths of an inch? So I just realized on this corner here, we were kind of overhanging a little bit. Actually, it was the other side that was overhanging a little bit. So I just squared it up totally flush on the end and remeasured it. And you know, we were just like a smidget out on our cross measurement. It's bang on now. So this lower cross member is tacked in place. We're gonna fit the top hats as they call them now or the coil mounts to. So I was flipping through the instructions again just to refresh my memory on how to do this. I read the instructions the other day, but, and uh, they recommend boxing the inside. So we'll probably end up boxing the inside, probably, I don't know, four inches from each side of the center line, about like that. So. Anyways, we'll do that in a bit. For now, we're gonna trim and fit these top rails, or top hats. So there's three, sorry, seven inches, seven inches wide. So I measured off our center line, three and a half inches on each side, and just marked seven inches here. There's two little uprights on the hats. I'll take you over to the bench here. We've got these two little uprights, and they need to be 30 inches from this outside to this outside. 30 inches outside to outside in order for the 
control arm geometry to be right. So we need to notch the sides here to fit over top of our frame essentially. They've got the anti-dive already put in, so you just mark this to be the top of your, sit on top of your frame. This is the front and then this is the back. So we'll cut however far in our, uh, you know what, I just realized I should probably turn these around because I think this front edge needs to sit on top of the frame and it's the back side that we got to trim. Hold up. All right, I've spun these around. It threw me off because it says trim on both sides, but you can't trim the other side because this has to sit flush on top of the frame rail. So we are, we're at our 30 inches here. So if we go and measure the frame, basically we're gonna lay that measurement in here and trim that back to whatever dimensions the frame are. All right, I've put uh, these little magnets here to simulate the outside edge of the frame so that like we can accurately measure it. So if we go from there to there, we've got 32 inches. So if those are already at 30, wait, no, it's the top that's at 30, 32 inches. We got to trim the bottom to be 32 inches. All right, let's, uh, let's find our center line here. This is 29. So that's 14 and a half. Come on, tape measure, work with me here. 14 and a half. We got 14 and a half on this side. Yeah. All right, so we need 32 inches. So half of 32 is 16. We gotta trim this back to there. All right, outside measurement here, 32 inches. So this is a little bit weird on these Fat Man ones because on the Heights and the TCI ones, these are already pre-trimmed for you to fit the frame and it, just, it makes them a lot easier to put together. But that wasn't a huge deal to do. They say the reason they do this is because then you can get it guaranteed to get it the right spot on every frame because you don't have to deal with the, the differences in frames. One frame might be you know, 32 inches wide and the next frame is 31 and three quarters of an inch wide. Or at least that's what they say in the book is the reason why they do this. All right, so we've trimmed our back edge to fit over the frame rail and now that sits nice just like that we've got our center line lined up these are supposed to tip back a little bit for the they call the anti-dive gives you a little bit of caster and that is the anti-dive is so that when you slam the brakes on and the front end goes down your caster doesn't get all kind of like I don't know kind of like preloading I guess okay these are we tack them on and then double check that our measurement is still 30 inches and 30 inches on each side, then these are good. I think before we do that though, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's do these boxing plates now while it's still easy to access everything. If we weld these on, it's gonna get a little awkward. It's already a little awkward with this tacked in there. I mean, we could take the tacks out, but I think we can, I think we can work around it.
So in the book, it says to make our boxing plate go four inches past the axle center line, which would put us about there. So our, our hat is gonna end there and our boxing plate's gonna end there. I think I might go a little bit further, make it 10 inches, which means it would start here and end here. So we'll make a mark make a mark and take our square all right Gonna clean the paint off of here so that we can make our marks. So this top rail is skinnier than the bottom rail. If we take our square here and put it flush on, uh, on the top here, you can see our bottom down here, you know, we're about a half inch in, which is fine. We can box it like that. What that means is we're gonna build our boxing plate to fit nice on the top here so that we can do a corner weld here and then on the bottom, it will just sit on top and then it actually makes it easier to weld that way because we can weld on this edge. I think it's, this frame's kinda of got a, a dip in the middle. So, you know what though? It's still right in the middle there. We're still overlapping. So it'll be fine. We'll just do, we'll just make it straight with the top. It'll come down and we'll do this top here. Let's get some poster board and mock up our boxing plate. All right, this is a piece of poster board. It's cut at just over 10 inches and six inches. Put a little bit of tape on there to hold it. This bottom edge is not flat. It's got a crown or a bow to it. So we gotta make our boxing plate to fit that. So if we hold that up like that, and then take something like this, we can transfer that frame rail into it. Oh no. Now we can cut it on those lines. Cool. Gonna cut a little bit more off because right now we're flush with the top, but we want the inside diameter. So that's about the thickness of the frame rail if I was to guess. Beautiful. So fit on this side. Yep. All right, we're gonna transfer this into the computer and then we can cut it out. So I use Fusion 360 to make a lot of my brackets and stuff and uh, it's got a cool option where you can just take a photo of your template with something to calibrate it off of, and then you can upload it in the computer and just trace it, like so.
Here's our boxing plates. I put a starburst in it just for a little bit of style. These are eighth inch. The frame rails on this truck, I thought were three sixteenths, but I measured them and they're, uh, I'm not sure what size exactly they are. They are smaller than three sixteenths and a little bit bigger than eighth inch. So I figured I'll just go with eighth inch. That's what uh, most hot rod chassis are made out of eighth inch or 10 gauge. So that should be heavy enough. It's pretty good in there. I'm gonna square it up and then we'll tack them in place. up now. Our boxing plates are all welded in. While I was welding, I decided to weld the cross member in as well. So our next step is to fit our top hats, make sure we got our 30 inches, and then we'll weld them in. All right, I've got our top hats clamped in place. They're a little bit of a pain in the ass to set up compared to the heights and the TCI ones that just click in place. but. I got it, I got it to work, I got them. They're both level, they're 30 inches apart, they're centered, let's tack them. Okay, our hats are fully welded on. So tomorrow morning, we've got these gussets that are supposed to go in here. So I'm gonna think overnight if I'm going to trim these gussets down and weld them flush to that, or should we lap them? That might be a bit stronger. We could lap it that way, or we could lap it on this side. I'm gonna think on that overnight come back to it tomorrow morning good morning Jim Hi. so it's the next day I've thought about this overnight and I think I'm going to overlap them like this reason being I don't know enough about the engineering structurally to know if this is stronger than having it underneath but I think it's overkill either way you do it the reason I'm gonna run it this way is I can run it up and weld across 
And then I can come on the inside here. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I can run another weld along the inside there. So it's welded on both sides. I also think having it over top like this, when you have a nice little bead along there, I think it'll look nice. It kind of gives it almost like an art deco look. And this is kind of an art deco looking truck. I, I mean, it probably drove by an art deco building at one time in its life. So it'll, it ties in, it matches, right? So I'm gonna clamp those in place and then weld them up. All our gussets are welded in. They turned out really nice. Although I did cheat a little bit. I wasn't gonna tell you guys, but now I am. I MIG welded the insides. I tigged one inside and it was just really awkward and hard and MIGing's easy. So I cheated and MIGed the, the hard part, but I think all of our fabrication part is done now and we can start focusing on the actual suspension part all right so for our suspension we've got spindles lower control arms these are the caliper brackets the disc brake caliper brackets upper control arms in this box here we've got calipers wheel bearings wheel seals dust caps tie rod ends these tie rod ends are a little bit taller than a a stock Mustang one just to help with alignment or uh, like the geometry part of it hardware kit and a rack extension what's a rack extension you ask well it's an extension that goes in your rack this is a 79 to 93 Mustang rack like a Fox body Mustang again there's no Mustang 2 parts ever in a what they call a Mustang 2 front end so the reason you use the 79 and 93 rack over the Mustang 2 rack is this rack will accept higher pump pressure better than the, the Mustang 2 one. We're still going to have to reduce the pump pressure because it's a Chevrolet pump and this is a Ford rack and they don't, they don't get along super well unless you drop the pressure. We'll cover that later, but we need to extend this. Why do we need to extend it? Let me show you. So that rack being designed for a 79 to 93 Mustang is set up for a vehicle with a track width of a 79 to 93 Mustang. John's old Fargo here is a little bit wider. And what does that mean? That means that these mounts where the lower control arms sit and the upper control arms, I guess, where the control arms mount on each side is wider than on a Mustang. So you got to widen the rack to accommodate that. So on our rack here, our outer tie rod goes on over here, but we've got our inner tie rod, I guess. I guess that's what you'd call it. There's a pivot point right here. And that is so this pivots up and down with the control arm. So here's your frame rail. Here's your lower control arm. Here's your upper control arm and your spindle. Those mount like that, that mounts like that. Your wheel goes on here. This moves up and down. Now off your spindle here, you've got your tie rod end. That's where this attaches. And it goes in. Yeah, it goes in. Sorry, lost my train of thought for a moment goes into where the actual rack is. That's this part. You need this pivot point right here to pivot at the same point as this does so that these travel up and down together. 
If you were to leave this rack the way it's set up for a Mustang, this pivot point would be back here. Now, I know what you're gonna say. Why don't you just get a longer tie rod in instead of putting the rack in? Well, you could do that. You could put a longer tie rod end in and it would get you your length all the way out to here. But now, when this goes up and down, it's pivoting from a different point. And that's gonna change the arc as this goes up and down. And when it changes the arc, if it goes up and down and these aren't on the same arc, what it's gonna do is this is gonna get shorter or longer than this during that arc. And that's gonna cause your wheels to go like this as you're going over bumps. That's what's known as bump steer. You go over a bump, the arc changes, this length changes from that length, and your wheels go in or out depending on which direction of the bump you're going up and down. So by adding a rack extension in there that essentially moves this pivot point from here back out to here, now they arc together and everybody's happy. You go down the road a happy boy. This here is our rack extension. Some kits come with one, some kits come with two. It doesn't really matter because this inside the rack, like from where our other point is over here, this is all just one piece that moves back and forth. So if we need this to be two inches wider, we can add one inch on this side and one inch on this side, or we can just add two inches on one side and that just shuffles everything down and we get the same overall width. And that's all that matters is your overall width is the same. So we're gonna peel this boot off. There's a little metal clamp in here and you cut that clamp off, slide this down and then we can take this assembly apart, add this in there, put it back together. So I can't get that boot to slide down any further, but that's fine, because we just need to get to here. So you put a crescent wrench on there, and then give it a good, and unthread it. Unthread that, oh yeah, it's all covered in Loctite. And then this guy simply threads in. some Loctite on this guy and then it just threads in. And we take this end here, put some Loctite on there, I'm almost out of Loctite. it threads in Ooh. I mean we can slide our boot back over and I just put a zip tie sand to hold it on rack extension done Ooh, almost done almost done with the rack extension Next step is to put the rack in. It came with the bushings already installed and came with hardware. Pretty straightforward. It just bolts into these mounts on the front. Comes with some lock nuts. The nuts go on the back side only because you can't get the bolt in from the back side. Uh oh, good thing I got another one here.
So sometimes on some of these vehicles, you have to put a little C-notch here for the steering rack to clear. But I think on this one, it's gonna be okay. Where'd that nut go? I don't think our impact is going to work for this. It doesn't fit in there. I guess we'll just do it the old school way. This is all going to have to come apart again because we got to paint all this stuff, but I want to build motor mounts before we paint anything because we're going to have to be welding motor mounts in. But you don't want to build your motor mounts until you have all this stuff in to make sure that you got your engine at the right height and that it's not going to interfere. Oh man, we're going to have a nice straight shot to our steering. We've got uh, seven and seven eighths to the outside on here and seven and three quarters to the outside on here. So if we give this just a this is just to uh, center the rack in there because when we added that extension in here, it kind of offset everything. So now we're kind of zeroed back out again. We got the same distance on both sides. So in theory, when we hook our steering wheel up, we'll center or get our steering wheel facing the right direction and our rack is already in the, the right spot. All right, lower control arm time. So. The straight arm goes to the rear. The curved arm goes to the front. We've got our really long bolt that goes through here. Maybe should have put this on before we put the rack on, but you know, we're here now, so we'll figure it out. Well, there it is in. I, <laughs> I forgot to record it for you guys. It's pretty straightforward. Bolt just goes through and that goes on the other end. It's uh, not super cranked down. You don't want to crank any of your suspension bushings down until they're under load at ride height because it'll if you tighten them up now the bushings get compressed here and then when you pull this up it twists and distorts the bushings so you always do that when it's at ride height under load i did unbolt one side of the rack and dropped it down just to make it easier to get this bolt in i swear when we did this on andrew Brittany's truck i put the control arms in first and then when I put the rack on, there was something weird and that the rack had to go in first. And also in the Fat Man Fabrications instructions, the photos they show, the rack goes in first. But it's definitely easier to put the control arms on without the rack. On the driver's side here, you know, I think we can, I think we can get this in without taking the the yeah, rack bolt out, it just puts enough of an angle on it. Maybe. It's not hard to take the rack out, it's literally the same size. Oh yeah. You okay. just have a big lock nut in the back. The upper control arms are the same side for side and they just bolt on like this. Now this is one thing with the Fat Man fabrication 
front end that is an improvement, in my opinion, over the TCI and the Heights front ends. It's the Heights front ends and the TCI front ends have slots in here with T-bolts that go from the bottom side. And this knurled surface here sits that way instead of that way. You tighten your T-bolts down and it holds it in place. The problem with that is I've had multiple times you hit a good bump and it jars it like that and those T-bolts will slip. So by having it go this way instead, it can't slide, can't slide back on you. you. Put shims in here, when you go to the alignment shop, that's how they set your caster. You put more shims in, it kicks this out and that gives you positive camber. You take shims out, slides it in, that gives you negative camber. Put a stack of shims on this side and no side. It's going to kick it back like that and that's what gives you your caster. How many washers we got? We got three washers here, so I'm assuming it goes this way. Washer in between and a washer on each end. I don't know, the, uh, when it goes to get a wheel alignment done, the alignment guy will have all this apart anyways. We just need it put together temporarily tight enough that you can get it to the alignment shop without your wheels falling off. So the spindles are pretty straightforward. They go on just like any other old spindle. It did mention in the instructions that the, the lower ball joint is a little bit taller than stock. And so there's a spacer that's supposed to go in there, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't appear that we have the spacer. So I'm wondering if that's maybe for like an older style design because it seems to fit okay. I already put the other side together. So I think that's fine. Notice I did not put the coil spring in yet or the shock. There's a reason for that. They don't recommend that you put the spring in until the truck is more assembled because without having any weight on the front end, you'll never get it together. Like as you're jacking this up to compress the coil, you're just gonna lift the whole truck off the jack stands. And they also don't want you to do that because if you did manage to get it in there, it puts too much tension on the ball joints with there being no weight in it. So what Fat Man recommends is while you're still assembling the truck to just put a solid steel bar from their lower shock mount up to the top here to kind of like mock up the, the ride height. So we'll probably do that next. In a perfect world, you want these lower control arms parallel with the ground, and that's kind of what dictates your ride height. So you can also get different spindles to change your ride height as well. These are standard spindles. Most of the aftermarket front ends, these IFS front ends, come with a two inch drop spindle, but John wants his truck to, he doesn't want it super low. He wants it to maintain almost a stock looking height. So we went with the standard spindle there is also, I've just recently discovered, a inch and a half raised spindle to raise it up even higher. But we'll go with these stock ones for now. Um, yeah, I guess we'll figure out our bar in here. So rather than build a bar that goes in where our coil spring was, I'm just gonna use the shock. I had these two pieces of scrap exhaust tubing that will fit in there like that. And we can slide that in there and slide that in there. And when this compresses to that length from our bolt here to the top here is the correct measurement that we want. So I might put a little bit of tape around there just to keep this centered. I guess it's not really gonna go anywhere, but it'll help. So now if we install our shock, Up through there, like so. Did I put that on the right way? No. 
flip that the right way. So when our shock compresses and this piece of exhaust tubing bottoms out on there, should be at the correct height for our suspension. Oh yeah, perfect. That's it. So these are brackets for mounting a GM metric style caliper to a Ford spindle. Uh, they are labeled left and right and they bolt on just like so. So as I was saying, they bolt on like so labeled left and right when I realized that the one that is labeled right and see how this one is labeled left are in fact the exact same bracket and they don't go on either way. They are left and right specific. So I think what happened is they sent me two lefts instead of a left and a right, but we can probably fix it. I think if we just cut this little slug out and relocate it to the other side of the bracket over here, it should be fine. I'm sure if I called them, they would happily send me a new one to fix this, but they're on the East Coast, they're in North Carolina. We're on the West Coast and yeah, they're already in bed right now. So that's one, uh, one thing that's uh, was a bit frustrating dealing with them on this is every time I had to call them to see how the order was coming and stuff. If you don't call them before like 10 o'clock in the morning, they've already gone home for the day. So we'll just zip this guy out flop it over to the other side, weld it back up, and put it in. Maybe if somebody from Fat Man is watching this video and sees this, they'll, like, I don't know, send me a coupon for free lunch or something. That'd be cool. I like lunch. Or maybe a t-shirt. So I've got this mocked up on here again. There's a spacer down here that when I tighten this bolt, it kind of sets our depth that way, which is pretty much just square, straight up and down with the spindle face here. And then I took this measurement here off of the other one. So we'll tack it up here and then fully weld it up on the bench. we go. Ooh, that's warm. So while we wait for that bracket to cool back down to a normal temperature, let's start putting the hubs together. So these are like 77 Ford Granada rotors, and these have the same bolt pattern as John's pickup use, so his stock wheels should work fine. The kit comes with new bearings and races. But these hubs that came with the kit also have new races in them. And it's the same part number for Mustang or Granada. So there's no need to change those. They're brand new. It's got new wheel seals as well. So yeah, I'm just gonna grease everything. I washed it all with some brake clean first because the rotors are, they're coated in some grease thing, some sort of packing grease that's not good for brake pads. And the bearings are also coated in a, I don't need any little hammer here. 
The bearings are also coated in like a packing grease, so I like to wash that off before I pack them with wheel bearing grease. Okay, there's one inner done. If you don't have one of these, you should probably get one. Bearing packer. Instead of doing it by hand, everyone's all like, oh, you gotta pack bearings the old school way. You know what? The old school way of packing bearings sucks. You get one of these, you just clamp the bearing in there, you hook up a grease gun to it, and just pump it through until it comes out the other side. Bam! Done. That's how long it takes to pack a bearing. Take a little bit of this, smear it on there. Look at that. These are like six bucks worth every penny. All right. Put our other seal in. Both inners are done. So I'm going to go ahead and do the outers. I'm going to put a little bit of grease on this seal. And let's slide her together. All right, where did our keyway go? There it is. All right, so back to this caliper bracket. That fits on there like that. And then down at the bottom here, there's this little aluminum spacer, and it goes in between the caliper bracket and the spindle. So this stuff should be Loctited, but because this is just a mock-up, it's all gonna come apart to get painted again. We're, uh, we're not gonna Loctite it. I gotta talk to John still if we're, this is just getting rattle canned or powder coated or the frame. I'd probably paint the frame with like 415. But that's his decision to make. And we gotta build motor mounts first. Alright. Let's put this spindle on. Or hub. Let's put this hub on. With both rotors on, we can put the calipers on now. Oh, that's backwards. They're also left and right specific. They are labeled, but the important part to know is, come on, get in there. There we go. The important part to know is the bleeder always goes to the top. Come on, get in there. Why won't that fit in there? Oh, there we go. There we go. The little uh, slider dealio is hanging up. I was nervous for a second. I thought maybe I screwed up when I welded that piece in, but it's fine. Yeah, 70, these are from a 70 to 76 Camaro. And oddly enough, 70 to 76 Camaro brake hoses work really good for these. They're long enough that they don't get tangled in the coil spring. All right, brakes are done.
All right, well, that is, that kind of wraps up our front end install. There's a couple things left that we have not covered. That is the steering. We got to figure that out still and cutting the coils to get our correct ride height. But we can't do any of that until the engine and transmission are in for good. I don't want to do any steering until the engine's in, in case we got to work around exhaust or something. It's way easier to do the steering after than it is to build your steering and then have to work your engine around that. So we're gonna cover all that in the next video, or at least putting the engine and transmission in in the next video. So if you're not already subscribed, do it now so that you know all about that when it happens. And yeah, there we have it. Fat Man Fabrication IFS front end in a 1950 Fargo. Overall, I was pretty okay with this, this install. The, uh, like I said, I've done TCI, I've done Heights, and now I've done Fat Man. The Heights one had the most screwing around to make it work. This was pretty straightforward. Just a little bit of trimming on here was the only weird stuff, and it wasn't even that weird. It was, you know, I'd totally install another one of these again, so I think it's a good product. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you want to support this channel, please check out the website, lgspeedcustom.com. Got all sorts of LG Speed and custom merch on there, as well as hot rod parts that we manufacture. So go check it out. And thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the next video.